Hi everyone and welcome back. In our last couple of lessons we explored the geometry of R2 and R3. Well it turns out that once you know a bit of vector geometry you can start to describe the curves and surfaces that exist in these settings and that's a huge part of Math 207. Well today we're going to start with the two simplest types of curves and surfaces, lines and planes. For more information on this please make sure to check out section 10.5 of the textbook. Okay, let's start by looking at lines in R2. Suppose that I give you a vector d. What happens if I consider all vectors that are multiples of this vector d? Well, this would include d itself, but it would also include things like 2d, which looks something like this, uh, 1 half d, which is a little shorter like that, um, minus d, hey, that goes the other way, right? I'm actually going to trace out an entire line of points that pass through the origin if I allow myself to use all multiples of this vector d. Wow, that's pretty cool. It means that I can represent this line using a vector equation. I could represent this line as the set of all vectors x that are of the form t times d, where here t can be any real number you like. We refer to d as the line's direction vector because it tells us in which way the line is moving. t is known as a parameter. It could represent any real number and it essentially stretches out that vector d. But of course, not all lines are going to pass through the origin. Suppose that we have a line like this. It passes through a point p, but not necessarily through 0, 0. How do we find the equation of this line? Well, let's think about this. If we just take all multiples of d, we're going to get this parallel line through the origin. So what we want to do is shift that line up to pass through p. So what I'm going to do is consider this vector that points from the origin to p. We'll call it p vector. If I add p vector to the line that I had before, all of my points are going to shift up. The line will be parallel to the one we had before, but now it passes through p. The equation of our line is therefore the set of all vectors x of the form p plus td, where here again, t can be any real number you like. Now compare this with the equation of a line that you know from high school, y equals mx plus b. In both cases, we have a slope or direction, and we have a point on the line. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, now you're probably wondering, how do you find that direction vector d? Well, if you have a second point on your line, say Q, so you know two points now, P and Q, uh, then what you can do is use this guy as your direction vector, the vector that points from P to Q. Well, what vector is that? Okay, that vector, when added to P, should give us Q. So that vector must be Q minus P. We can use Q minus P as our direction vector. Now what's really nice is that all of this theory extends to higher dimensions. For example, if you want to write down the equation of a line in R3, it's going to look exactly the same. P, a point on the line, plus T times D, a direction vector for the line. Now let's check out some examples. Okay, in the next few examples, we're going to be finding vector equations of lines in R2. So in the first case, I'd like to find the equation of the line that passes through the point 2, 3 and moves in the direction of 4, 1. Okay, well if you understood the equation on the last slide, this should be no problem. We are given a point on the line, P, and we're given the direction vector. So our line is the set of all vectors x of the form 2, 3 plus t times 4, 1, where here t is allowed to be any real number. Okay, for part B, we're looking for a line that passes through 2, 3 and is parallel to this line. This is a line that passes through 1 minus 1 and moves in the direction of 3, 5. Well, let's think about this. If our line has to be parallel to this one, they're going to be moving in the same direction. They just pass through different points. That means that our line must pass through 2, 3 and moves in the direction of 3, 5. So just like before, we get an equation x equals 2, 3 plus t times 3, 5, and t here belongs to the real numbers. Finally, in part c, we're looking for a line that passes through 2, 3 and 1, 6. 
Hmm, we haven't been given a direction vector this time. But luckily on the last slide, we saw how to compute the direction vector given two points on the line. If this is P and this is Q, then our direction vector can be given by Q minus P or P minus Q, doesn't matter. So in this case, I can use the direction vector D equal to 1, 6 minus 2, 3. That gives me minus 1, 3. The equation of the line is therefore the set of all vectors X. And now I guess I could use either P or Q. They're both points on the line. Let's use Q. X equals 1, 6 plus T times minus 1, 3. Again, T is a real number. Now that we know how to find the equations of lines in Rn, we're ready to move up to the next level of sophistication, a plane in R3. This is a two-dimensional surface living in a three-dimensional world. Now the equation of a plane isn't so complicated. To see where it comes from, suppose that I give you some vector n living in R3, and I ask for all vectors x that are perpendicular to that n. Well, remember, a vector x is perpendicular to n if and only if its dot product with n is equal to 0. So the 0 vector, for example, will satisfy that condition. 0 dot n is 0. But there are lots of other vectors that are perpendicular to n as well. This blue vector, for example, and this blue vector. And in fact, this entire plane of vectors, this plane that passes through the origin, this consists of all vectors that are perpendicular to n. This, folks, is the key observation that's going to allow us to write down the equation of a plane through the origin. A plane through the origin consists of all vectors that are orthogonal to some given vector n. We refer to this n as a normal vector for the plane. So our equation is the set of all vectors x, y, z, such that n dot x, y, z is equal to 0. If we expand this out using our definition of dot product, we're looking for all x, y, z such that n1, x plus n2, y plus n3, z is equal to 0. We refer to this as the scalar equation for our plane. So for example, what's the scalar equation of the plane through the origin that's orthogonal to this vector here, 2, 1, 3? Well, 2, 1, 3 is playing the role of n. It's the normal vector for the plane. According to our equation, our plane is 2x plus 1y plus 3z is equal to 0. We now know how to find the equation of a plane that passes through the origin, given its normal vector n. But what if our plane doesn't pass through the origin, but instead passes through some other point p? How do we find the equation then? Well, it's not simply all vectors x that are orthogonal to this normal vector. After all, this vector, x, points to something on our plane. But you can see that x and n are not perpendicular. Hmm, okay, x and n might not be perpendicular, but I'll tell you what is perpendicular to n, this vector. This vector, which points from p to x, lies flat in the plane, and therefore it's orthogonal to our normal vector. What's this vector again? Oh right, we've seen this a couple times. The vector that points from p to x is x minus p. So our plane consists of all x such that n dot x minus p is equal to 0. Just like on the last slide, we can now expand our dot product formula to get the scalar equation for our plane. If the coordinates for this x vector are x, y, z, and the coordinates for my p vector are p1, p2, p3, then the equation of my plane is n1 times x minus p1 plus n2 times y minus p2 plus n3 times z minus p3 is equal to 0. This, folks, is the general scalar equation for a plane in R3. For example, suppose you want to know the scalar equation for the plane that passes through the point 1, 1, 3 and has normal vector 1, 0, 4. Well, 1, 1, 3 is going to play the role of p and 1, 0, 4 is going to play the role of n. So according to our formula, the equation should be 1 times x minus 1 plus 0 times y minus 1 plus 4 times z minus 3 is equal to 0. Now you can simplify this if you like by getting rid of that 0 term in the middle. 
That'll leave you with x minus 1 plus 4 times z minus 3 equals 0. And if you like, you can even move the constants to the other side. If you expand out the multiplication, you should be left with x plus 4z equals 13. Now this is pretty cool, but notice that all of our examples so far rely on us already knowing the normal vector n. The question is, how do you find that vector? We're going to learn how to do so in our next video involving the cross product.